How many of you guys are thankful for God's compassion this morning? I'm so thankful for His compassion. And as we go through our series, The Power of God's Compassion, today we're going to talk about the power behind miracles. I'm not a testimony of a, a physical healing, if it were, like, uh, you know, my leg was, I uh, was walking with a limp and God healed me and now I can walk good. Uh, I had back problems, God healed me, and then now I don't have any more. I'm not that kind of healing testimony. I think my kind of healing testimony is like a healing in the brain. You know, the way I think, the way I, I do things, maybe the, the way my life was patterned and my behavioral patterns, that God healed me in that kind of way, and, and I think he still is healing me with the way I think because I still need him every single day of my life to think like him, to say the things that he's saying and do the things that he does. Some of you might be a result of a miraculous healing of a physical ailment, uh, maybe some kind of illness that you've had, and God healed you. And so that's your experience of a miracle. But like Pastor Charlie said, not every single miracle were healings. See, in the Bible, it says that there were so many healings that took place and so many things that Jesus did that the world's libraries could not contain everything that he did. So we may, we may liken a miracle of Jesus Christ to a, a physical healing, and I think sometimes that's what we're taught, that a healing is a physical thing. But sometimes God heals a marriage, and that's a miracle. Sometimes he heals a relationship between family members, and that's a miracle. A miracle can be described as something only God can do that we can't. So there are things, like let's just say what Ben was talking about with the invitations that you pass out to your family and friends. Or maybe you're thinking, I can't pass this out to so-and-so. No way they would come to church. There's no possible way they would ever come to church. Then there's going to be a miracle. Because it's something you cannot do that only God can. There are miracles that take place in our lives, and if we are not aware of it, we're going to miss it. Every day there are miracles that are taking place but we may only think of a miracle as someone rising from the grave or someone being healed physically. But we're going to learn that there is something before miracles. There are things that happen before miracles. There's something of God's compassion that we're going to learn about. And maybe we ne never learned before. Maybe we're learning about from great comebacks in a sports game to uh, uh, an accident that's been avoided or an injury that never took place that should have. We always use the phrase, it's a miracle. And so what we want to learn is the power behind miracles and what moved Jesus to do miracles. What, what was behind all of that? Because it's more than just the physical that we experience. We also are made up of body, uh, excuse me, mind and soul, not just the physical part. So God wants to show us in a broader perspective that there are so many more things that are 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 part of a healing process than just a physical thing. If, if you were to think of a miracle, uh, we may have our definition as something only God can do, but let me just uh, give you the definition of what the, the, the dictionary says. A miracle is a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by nature or scientific laws, and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. So it's kind of like your children when they clean their rooms before you tell them to. That is a miracle. Or your husband making his own honey-do list, knowing what you want, and then accomplishing it right after. That would be a miracle. Or your wife being wrong just once. That would be a miracle. So a miracle are things that only God can do. It's not just the things that, that we throw on the, just with words that, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. It's, it's really things that God does. But what comes before the miracle? There's a story in the book of Luke that, that Jesus gives as an illustration because someone said, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God with all your heart, so mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the person wanting to justify their own actions said, and who's my neighbor? So he gives the parable of the good Samaritan, where you had this one person who 
fell on the wayside and was ill, got injured. And then a priest walked up and saw him, but walked on the other side. A Levite saw him, walked on the other side. Because the priest and the Levite, they would serve in the temple of God, and if they touched someone who was injured or even a dead body, they would be unclean, so they could not worship in the temple. So they didn't want to defile themselves, so they walked on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, one who didn't get along with this person, came along and had compassion. Say the word compassion. Compassion. He had compassion on this one person, bandaged him up, and sent him on his way, and even paid for his medical bills. And I thought, that's, that's the power of God's compassion. It's, it, it, it does something that no one else is willing to do. It does something inside of us that we normally wouldn't do. And then number one, you can write this in, before every miracle, there are problems. Before every miracle, there are problems. And you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to have plenty of miracles then. I get plenty coming my way. But before every miracle, there are problems. And you're going to find that out as we continue. Life is filled with problems. Even Jesus himself encountered problems. Look at Matthew 15, 32 in your notes. It says, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have, what's the word? Compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint along the way. So Jesus had a big problem. He's, he's doing his public ministry and here's all of these people following him. He's healing people and they continue to follow him and the crowds grew but they didn't bring anything to eat. They're just continuously following Jesus Christ. So now Jesus has a problem, huge problem. There's no food, no one to feed them. Now, some of us would say, you know what, just send them home. Tell them to go home already. You know, when people are at your house and you have a big party and you forgot to bring out the pokey, you forgot to bring out the good stuff or the dessert that you only had one pan, it wasn't going to feed everyone. So we're just not going to share. Wait till kind of everybody go home and then we'll break that out. We can think of it in that way, but Jesus had absolutely nothing. And he had a problem. He wanted to feed these people because he had compassion. See, when we encounter moments that challenge us, will we be like Jesus and have compassion for people or be selfish in our own self, with our own selfish ways and, and not be compassionate? You know, you know what this shows me? That even though the people did not have anything to eat and even though... Jesus looked around and there are thousands of people. It looked impossible that these people could eat. He was still their provider. He was still able to provide for them. There's another problem that Jesus encountered in Matthew 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. See, Jesus cares about us and, and, and what we follow or who we follow, and he knows that we're like sheep. You know, sheep, they're, they're not the brightest animals. They're not the smartest, but they will follow their shepherd. And Jesus is saying, sometimes you're busy doing whatever you're going to do, but you have no idea where you're going. Therefore, you need a shepherd. And he had so much compassion that he says, and you, your life is worth more than just living and existing. You have a purpose for living. But we need a shepherd to guide us, and Jesus cares about who we are and where we're going, and he wants to guide us like a loving shepherd. There were two blind men when Jesus came into the city, and, and here, here are these blind men, and they're asking, what is all the commotion about? And they said, oh, it's Jesus, he's coming in. Now, these two blind men, they understand that, wait a minute, is this the Jesus that, that heals people? So maybe it's our opportunity to be healed. So they cry out to Jesus, and the crowds tell them, hey, shh, it's Jesus. And they're like, yeah, we know. Jesus, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowds tried to quiet them. But Jesus heard them, and he went up to them. In Matthew 20, verse 34, Jesus had compassion 
and touched their eyes, and immediately their, their eyes received sight, and then they followed him. It starts with Jesus having compassion. Major problems. Big problem. Jesus comes into the city. And here are these guys yelling and screaming, and here's the crowd trying to quiet them. What is Jesus going to do? How is he going to respond to this situation? Well, he actually heals these two blind men. He does something nobody else can do. See, with every miracle, there's going to be problems. These two guys had a big problem. They could not see. Jesus had a big problem. Stress right before the actual incident took place with the crowd, the crowd stressing out that these two guys are bothering. It's just a, it's not a good place. It's not a good setting. But Jesus comes in, and right before the miracle, he has compassion. There's always going to be problems before the miracle. Here's another big problem. Mark 1, verses 40 through 42, it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. See, in those days, the leper actually had to say unclean. If someone came within 25, 50 feet, they would have to start yelling unclean. Because if, they, if someone touched them, then they would be unclean, not be able to worship. That's how it was back then. So the leper had to walk around, and anytime someone came nearby, they would have to say unclean, unclean, then the other person would move and stay out of their way. In other words, that person who had leprosy was probably the loneliest person in the world. Hundreds of people who cannot come near them, cannot have physical contact. And I wonder if many of us, that's how we come to Christ. We come to him feeling unclean, and even around other people, or, or even around church, we come to church and we're thinking, I'm unclean, I don't, I don't want to be around people, I don't, I don't want nobody to know, and, and so we just, in our own hearts, we say, unclean, unclean. And so we don't, we don't even want to look up at people. We feel so unworthy and, and we don't want to bother anybody. We don't even want to be around church because we think this is where all the holy people are. This is not where all the holy people are. I don't know about you, but I'm not that holy. There's only one who is holy, and that's Jesus Christ. We're all imperfect, serving a perfect God. So when this leper came and said, unclean, unclean, Jesus had an opportunity. And it's interesting how the leper comes to him and he says, Jesus, if you are willing, if you are willing, it's okay, Tava, it's okay. <laughs> it's my nephew. To be willing is what Jesus is. To be willing to heal. Now imagine this, this, this leper coming up to Jesus. It's not like, Hey, Jesus, if you're willing, can you make me clean? It's with a broken heart that I've never had someone come near me this close. Oh, Jesus, if, if you're willing, I know you can do this. If you're willing, can you make me clean? Can you make me acceptable? Can you, can you do something about this? It's a big problem in my life. I can't do a single thing about it. I, I want to... I want to date someone. I want to be with that person. I want to hug people. I want to be around my friends. Can you do something about this because I'm unclean? And Jesus smiles and he says, I'm willing. But not only does Jesus says the words that I am willing, he reaches out and he touches this man who is untouchable. Because if you touch this man, you now become unclean. Listen, Jesus was willing to become unclean in the sight of men so that this man can be clean in the sight of God. And Jesus was willing to go to the cross for you and I so that we would be cleansed before God. Jesus wants to heal us. But before every miracle, we're going to have those problems. And then this is what we're going to encounter. The second thing, before every miracle, my faith will be tested. We're all, we'll all be tested. Our faith will be tested. Every one of these miraculous healings, every single person's faith was tested. With all of these miracles every single person's faith was tested when you're encountering problems your faith is being tested it's in that instance where you're either going to push through 
and mature or give up and stay the same? How many times we see Christians who follow Christ who aren't able to pass a certain maturing point in their walk with Jesus and struggle with the same things year after year after year because they're unwilling to change. Because faith is going to be tested. And it's at that instance that I'm going to either say, I'm going to push forward and mature and grow in you, or throw in the towel and say, nah, it's them, it's them, it's them. No, don't agree. No, 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 no. And we never grow in our relationship with God. But he's willing. Mark 5, excuse me, Mark 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, and because of their unbelief, he could do He couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. For some of us, I think God is trying to heal us, but we want God to heal us in the way we think we need healing. We want him to do what we want in our lives, not the way he wants. But because we don't believe he can do anything with the problem at hand, he can't do anything more in us. And it amazes him that we're not willing to put our faith in him to change us. He's amazed at that. Even the disciples were tested with their faith. In the book of Luke, Jesus encounters another problem. Here we are with thousands of people, again, following him. And now he needs to feed them again because they're hungry. Well, the disciples come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, uh, there's a lot of people again. Uh, We got to feed them. They're hungry. What are we going to do? Now, in this case, Jesus says, you feed them. And they're like, oh, oh, you're, you're so funny. Well, uh, what do you want us to do? He said, no, you feed them. And they said, are you kidding? We don't have anything. But then, here comes this little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. And, and so the disciples come up to Jesus and say, look, this is all we got. Are you kidding me? You're telling us to go feed the people? So watch what Jesus does. I, I love what he does. This is so... Jedi mind trick, ninja-ish. It's like Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, verse 16, then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. So imagine now the disciples saying, okay, Jesus, we've got to feed all these people. Okay, what do we have? We only have five loaves and two fish. Why don't you send them away? Let them go buy their own food. He says, no, no, no. Had them sit down in groups, and then let's pray. He prays, he blesses the food, and then he gives them to the disciples. Now, I can imagine the disciples taking the food from Jesus and saying, so what do you want us to do with this? Go pass them out. (laughs) You're so sly because you don't want to face the people. You give it to us because you see Brada in the back, and he can eat all of this by by himself, and you don't want to face him, so you want me to do this. Ah, (laughs) you're a good teacher. You're teaching us something, okay. Feed the big guy first. I understand, okay. So maybe they go pass it out to the people, and as they're passing it out, they don't know what's happening. They're just passing out bread and, and fish, and now you go, brother, hey, hey, auntie, how you? Hey, good, good. Hey, you got, hey, you had two. Hey, give me that. And so passing them out, passing them out. You got your pocket, you got, yeah, okay, good. They're passing them out, passing them out. Not until afterwards did they understand that they were in the midst of a miracle. They didn't know the miracle was happening. All they knew is what Jesus was saying, and then they followed it. Because I think many of us are skeptical when Jesus says, do this. And we're like, ah, what do you mean, do this? I I can't do that. He says, and and if we don't understand God's compassion, and that our faith is being tested, we will never experience the miracle because many of us are in the midst of a miracle right now, and we don't even know it. He's saying, your faith is being tested. Before every miracle, our faith will be tested. God is waiting for your faith to bring his miracle. Just like with these two blind men in Mark 10, 52, then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. See, there's there's an interesting thing that happens that takes place. When people were healed and there was a miracle that took place, they followed Christ because they understood that it wasn't about the miracle, it was about the person. There's another story, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years that she could not find any healing. She went to all the doctors and could find nothing, no help, no cure. 
But she thought, if I can just touch the hem of Christ's robe, then I'm, I might be healed. If I can just touch his robe. So Jesus is coming through the crowd, and here she is making her way. Excuse me, excuse me. Just touch the robe. Got him. Whew. Healed. And she felt healed. Now Jesus feels some power coming out of him, and he says to his disciples, hey, who touched me? And they're like, uh... I don't want to tell you, but there's like 50 people around you right now and even more. So there's, everybody's bumping into you. He goes, no, no, no. Someone touched me in a specific way because power came out of me. And so Jesus looked around and now they found out it was this woman. And so in Matthew 9, 22, Jesus turned around. And when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Here's what happens. I think for many of us, we're okay if we bump into Jesus. We're okay if we just bump into him and I'll just bump into Christ every now and then. I'll bump into Christ uh, on a Sunday. I'll just bump into him. I'll read the Bible once in a while. I'll pray to him. Uh, once in a while, I'll just bump into Christ. This lady reached out for Christ with all the faith that she had. Because she knew that it wasn't about bumping into Jesus Christ. It was reaching out to him to just touch the hem of his robe. And it was just touching the hem of his robe that power was released from Jesus Christ. Listen, if you just want to bump into Jesus Christ, no power is available to you. But if you want to reach out to him and put your faith in him, power will be released from Christ and pour out into your very own life where healing will take place. I don't want to just bump into Christ. I want to be in this relationship with him. I want to be where he's at, and I want to learn from him. But we got to reach out to him. It's going to, our faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. Are we going to reach out to Christ or just bump into him once in a while? See, it's, it's us who God is waiting for to unleash his greatest miracles. Not us to just come to church and, so that I feel better. It's so that I can reach out and touch Jesus Christ. Your faith is going to be tested before every miracle. And then the last thing, number three, before every miracle, Jesus is motivated. He's motivated by compassion. There's that word again, compassion. He's motivated by it. Before every miracle, Jesus was moved with compassion. And it's not an obligated compassion. I think you and I, we were kind of, we grew up with this obligated compassion. That if you're playing with your friends or your relatives and, and both of you get hurt and, and, and the other person is more injured than you, you must act injured so you don't take the hit. I mean, you could be on the ground and both of you are on the ground and, and they're saying, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. He just fell and you look and, oh, bone is sticking out. Then you feel hurt. Ah, me too. Ah, what happened? I don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, 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 both of us. Both of us, we hurt. Both of us are hurt. Have compassion on both of us. It's like an obligated compassion. What happened to you? I'm going to hang down. What happened to him? His femur is sticking out. So you feel like you have to have compassion. Jesus doesn't have an obligated compassion. He has compassion because that's his nature. That's who he is. It's an automatic move of God. It's who he is. He's a compassionate, loving God. In Psalm 72, verse 13, it says, He will have compassion on the poor and needy, and the lives of the needy He will save. Did you know that God had compassion for you and I before we even met Him? He already had compassion on us. Many of these people who were healed did not believe in Jesus Christ when they called out to Him. Some of them just took a risk They just said, Jesus, if you're willing. But because of that, they put their faith in him. Because he was moved with compassion and they understood that how much they were loved, they understood how much they were valued. And so they followed him. Miracles do not begin with your belief in Jesus. It actually ends up there. See, many of us will come to the Lord and and kind of uh, sometimes uh, skeptical or, or reluctant, and then, and then we understand his compassion. And then God says, here's what I'm showing you. I'm showing you my love and my compassion. 
And then it ends up with our belief in him. That's the truest miracle. It's a life that is changed by God. It happens as a result of his compassion. There's another incident that took place, and it was a funeral procession. And it says in Luke 7, verses 13 through 15, when the Lord saw her, he's speaking of the mother, I've got to remember, he saw her. She didn't see him. He saw her. He felt, what? Compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. See, Jesus is that concerned about us that he sees us first before we ever see him. And he has compassion for us that's the power behind every miracle is that jesus has compassion you want to see the greatest miracle ever the greatest miracle is when god can take someone like you and i redeem us pour out his compassion on us give us his compassion and now we in turn give compassion to other people as sinners as people who have done wrong against god He gives us his compassion, and now we are compassionate towards other people. 1 Peter 3, 8, it says, Finally, all of you, that includes all of us, be of one mind, having compassion. Having what? Compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. See, the power behind God's compassion and the power behind his miracles is not in us. It's in him. It's not of us. It's because of the power of God's compassion. He's going to use that compassion that he gives to you so that you and your spouse will have a wonderful marriage, that healing is going to take place. He's going to use that compassion for your children that will bring healing to that relationship. Or he's going to use your compassion to bring someone to receive him as their Lord and Savior. And you might say, That's, all those things sound great, but that's impossible. God has compassion for you to be your provider. He's, compassion, he's compassionate towards you and I to lead us as, as the shepherd. You might think, but those, are, those things are impossible. Then, then a miracle can take place. And whenever you doubt that God can do something, I want us to read this last scripture together. This is what we're going to recall to our mind. It's, it's kind of our, our centerpiece scripture for this series. Lamentations 3 verses 21 through 24. Let's read this all together. Ready? Go. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. See, when I'm touched by the power of God's compassion, I'm better, should be better, than what I was yesterday and no longer the same because that in its truest sense is what a miracle is and that only happens by the power of God's compassion amen and put away your notes and close your Bibles we're gonna pray together so if you would bow your heads let's pray to the God of compassion Lord we thank you for giving us another opportunity to learn from you to glean from you and to experience just your presence. I I do pray for those that maybe they're searching for you, that you would do something special in their hearts. And maybe they need to cry out to you. Maybe it's like the, the blind man who cried out to you, even though people said, be quiet. Maybe it's like the woman who needed to be healed from the flow of blood that that instead of bumping into you on a Sunday, that we reach out to you every single day because our faith will be tested. We're going to encounter problems, but before every miracle, there are problems. And the good news is that you are about being compassionate, that you're moved with compassion, and that's the power behind every miracle, that you're moved with compassion, but not every miracle is a physical healing. It may be a heart that is changed for you, a marriage that becomes stronger, a family that unites together, a business that thrives because they believe that you're the provider. Lord, we pray right now that we would understand the power behind these miracles because it all starts with you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. We all said,